Tim's comments on the time enjoyed in fellowship. Uh, certainly I've enjoyed the time that we had to uh, spend together today and I've enjoyed the time to spend with each of you I know so I've had some more time to spend with some than with others I guess that's just kind of the way it works I, I would love to spend more time with each of you but certainly in this day and age when it seems like uh, fellowship is scarcer at the same time when things are scarce doesn't that make them all the more precious and so we certainly ought to value such occasions all, all the more and the blessing we have a fellowship of those of like precious faith. And so I've enjoyed certainly the meals and I, I would likewise share in my appreciation for the meals, those who prepare them, they've been, been delicious and uh, certainly for all the efforts that have been put forth in this meeting and the various efforts. We've been speaking about seeking salvation during this week and we've hopefully impressed upon us the thought that seeking salvation does not end once you arise from the waters of baptism. The Christian life beginning at baptism and ending at physical death is described in scripture as a race. We read in Hebrews 12 and verse 1, for example, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, notice it speaks about that race, but it says that something is needed to run that race. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, when we think about patience, we think about the ability to stand in line or the ability to wait on all these, you know, when you're on hold and waiting for this machine to get to another machine to get to another machine before you get to an actual person without blowing up in anger. We think that's what patience is. But historically, patience has had a much deeper meaning than that. And if one consults Webster's 1828 dictionary and looks at patience, one of the things it will say is that patience can mean perseverance constancy in labor or exertion. That's why such translations of the New King James Version and others translate that as endurance. That's what's being spoken about we need there. We need to run that race with endurance. You've heard that saying, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And that's certainly what we have in the Christian race. Endurance is essential to our final salvation. As the Lord said, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Mark 13, 13. Jesus said in Luke 9, 62, that no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. It speaks about what is barely sort of the task but doesn't keep on doing what he intended. We read in Revelation 2 and verse 10, what was said to the church there at Smyrna, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison ten days, and you shall be tried. Now, that was what was said to them. Be sure that the devil is going to do various things to us that we will be tried. And that ten days was not literal. It's a figurative expression for an indefinite but long period of time. And so our trials might be something else. It might be being surrounded by error. It might be various types of temptation. Anything that the devil can get you to do to give up and say, I quit. I've had enough. That's what the devil wanted to do to those at Smyrna, and that's what he wants to do to you. But he said, don't worry about that. Don't fear those things. The devil is going to do those things. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. We need to have that same willingness. The sober warning is given in 2 Peter 2 verses 20 through 22 about those who have fallen along the wayside. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that is, they have been saved from their sins, but he goes and says, but they're again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Now it speak about, speaks about those who are saved, but then speaks about a worse end because something has happened. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of truth than that they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it's happened to them according to the true proverb, 
the dog has turned to his own vomit again, and the saddle is washed to her wallowing in the mire. That is a scary, scary thought. We need to make sure that we make it through to the finish line once we have begun the Christian race. <clears throat> now, any physical athlete who seeks to be successful will seek to build endurance. Whether it's a football player, basketball player, a track star, we're going to do various things to make sure that they build that endurance. And if we are going to be successful in the Christian race, there are prerequisites to building endurance which each of us must meet. And so during the time that we have this evening, I'd like for us to consider some of those prerequisites. One of those prerequisites to building endurance is goals. <clears throat> Rarely is anything worthwhile accomplished haphazardly. The story is told about a young police officer who had to go do training and on the way back from his training he was going to visit some extended family that he hadn't seen since childhood who lived out in the country but he was going to spend the night with them and he was going to kind of take a little walk around the around the grounds around the back 40 and just kind of take a look around and as he's walking around he sees a bullseye on a tree or he sees a target on a tree, and right in the middle of the bullseye, there is one bullet hole. Just one right in the smack dab middle of that bullseye. Looks around, sees other trees, just the same way. There are targets on the trees, and just one shot right dead center of the bullseye. On the back, a bunch of targets on there. And in each one of them, just one bullet hole right in the middle of that bullseye. <clears throat> and so that night at supper, he was expressing his surprise and how impressed he was that someone had such marksmanship. And Aunt Matilda spoke up and said, no, that's just Cousin Cletus. He shoots first and draws the targets later. <laughs> that's the way a lot of people approach life. Whatever kind of things happen, they say, well, yeah, that's kind of what I meant to do. That's what I was shooting for. That's what I was trying for. I really wasn't, you know, they make it seem like that's what their, that's what their goal was. But you look at success stories in, in various respects, and usually there is some planning involved. There are goals that have been set. You look at someone like Scotty Scheffler, if you're not familiar with him, he's one of the rising stars and one of the main stars in golf today. But he started when he was very young. His father gave him a little plastic golf set, and when he was still in single digits, he was beating professional golfers in little games of kind of putting contests and things like that. And he always set goals for himself and would rise those higher goals and higher goals and higher goals until he became the leading money winner on the PGA Tour. Similar with Tiger Woods, and we could talk about some other issues, but as far as his skill in golf, that's unquestioned. And again, as a very young child, he began and was setting goals for himself and was obviously very driven. And the same goes for vir virtually every other success story. There are goals that have been set. Now, there are goals for which every single Christian should strive. Now, they really ought to be obvious, the ones I'm going to tell you, and the first one is to go to heaven. I hope if you are a Christian, you have going to heaven as your goal, and why wouldn't you? That is the great goal, that is the great objective of the Christian life. We're promised that there remains therefore rest for the people of God. We read in Hebrews 4 and verse 9, and verse 11 says, Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So why do we persevere? Why do we keep running? Because we want to enter into that rest, into heaven itself. And so that needs to be a goal of the life that we're living. Another goal of our life ought to be to glorify God. Paul wrote, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. 
Do everything to God's glory. That's what we as Christians are here for. That others might see the glory of God. The church declares the glory, declares the wisdom of God according to Ephesians 3, 10 and 11 and 3, 20 and 21. The church does this and we are to show God's glory. Also, another goal for Christians ought to be to see others saved. And of course, ultimately to enter into heaven. As Paul wrote to the church of Thessalonica, for what is a hope? or joy, or crown of rejoicing. Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and joy. 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 19 and 20. And so Paul was looking forward to on that day of judgment, saying that they would hear those words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That he anticipated greatly. And that would be a goal for each one of us. And another goal for each of us ought to be to become like Christ. We're told in Romans 8, 29, For whom God did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And so we as Christians are to be like him, to have his character, to have his purity to the best of our ability. And so these are goals for which every Christian should strive, no exception. Now these are major objectives, obviously. And as one individual I know used to like to say, Rome, Georgia wasn't built in a day. And so the uh, same way, there are smaller goals for the, which the Christian must strive and attain along the way to those major objectives. And so we begin with little smaller things. Now, now we understand that we're going to face temptation. At times we may find ourselves yielding to temptation. But the thing is, each time we do find ourselves overtaken by a sin, we have given in to temptation, we've also given ourselves a goal. Next time, we're going to handle this differently. And we begin to think about approaches that we can take to, to avoid that temptation, to resist that temptation. And so we give ourselves a little goal. Other smaller goals that we might take, again, if we want to see others saved and to enter into heaven, well, purpose saying, well, today I'm going to talk to somebody about the one church for which Jesus Christ died. And maybe say, I'm going to talk to this specific somebody today about the one church for which Christ died. And anytime you observe someone faltering in his or her faith, encourage that person. Seek to build that person up. We need goals. In 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 3, Paul spoke about some various things for which he was thankful for the Thessalonians and they had a work of faith and a labor of love and a patience of hope. There's that word again. But what is hope? That is the wish joined with expectation. It's a looking forward to of something, of seeing goals realized. And that is what builds up just like it's a labor of love. They labor because they love. They have faith, therefore they work. It's a work of faith. And we have this patience, this endurance that comes by means of hope. As Mary Shelley said, nothing contributes so much to tranquilize the mind as a steady purpose, a point on which the soul may fix its intellectual I. And so we're looking at something that we are seeking to accomplish. We need to have those goals. And once goals are set, and once goals begin to be achieved, faith is increased, and all of this is essential to building endurance. That brings us then to the next prerequisite to building endurance, and that is commitment. Once you have set your goals, the question is, are you going to keep after them, 
Or are you going to allow your first setback to say, I'm going to minimize my goals. I'm really not going to worry too much about seeing other folks saved. I'm not going to worry about this. I'm not going to worry about that. Maybe get to the point where you don't even worry about going to heaven any longer. Let me read you a quote from a certain basketball player. He said this, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over again in my life. And hear that, you're like, well, this guy must have eventually gave up basketball, right? This guy's a failure. That's not the end of the quote. Let me pick up where I left off. Yes, it did say I've failed over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. The basketball player who made this statement was Michael Jordan, considered by many to be the greatest basketball player ever to have lived. And so, yes, he failed again and again, but he kept after it. He did not give up. And we must have the attitude that regardless of whatever happens, we're going to persevere and achieve every one of our spiritual goals. Now again, when we talk about goals, we want to focus on those that God has laid before us. But we can look through God's word and identify various ones we need to achieve and be commit to those things. Now one must make a commitment upon becoming a Christian. And one must continually reevaluate his commitment to staying the course. Paul said, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not how that Jesus Christ is in you? Except ye be reprobates. That word can be translated again as we mentioned in another verse, disqualified. You can be disqualified and not even realize you've been disqualified from the Christian race because you've lost sight of everything. Your commitment isn't what it was. And so you ask yourself, am I, am I meeting the goals of New Testament Christianity? Am I meeting those goals? And to have that commitment, you need to have that right attitude. We sang that song a moment ago about some dwelling where those kind of attitudes of constant pessimism and negativity, negativity and doubt lie. Well, we need to have that positive attitude. James even said, my brother, count it all joy and fall into diverse temptations. Wait, what? Well, the thing is, we're all going to fall into manifold trials. We're all going to have difficulties. But count it all joy regardless. In Acts 4 and verse 36, we're told about a certain individual who became a prominent disciple, and the apostles gave him a little nickname, Barnabas, which is the, the King James Version, we're told, means the son of consolation. And the New King James Version says, son of encouragement. We're told about others who might have been sons of thunder because we're calling lightning and fire to come down from heaven and consume certain people. But here was one who was characterized by encouragement. That's the kind of attitude that the Lord's church needs. And we need to have a single-minded focus upon the goals that have been set for us. True spiritual goals in harmony with God's will. The Apostle Paul said, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. He said, he said I've, not, I've not reached the finish line yet. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth from those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He kept pressing to the mark. And we need to do the same. We need to have that same level of commitment. Well, there's something else that is a prerequisite to building endurance, and that is exercise. Paul speaks about that in 1 Timothy chapter 4. As he says in verse 7 of that chapter, they refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. 
again, we understand quite well the place of exercise and building up physical endurance, but spiritually we are told that we are to exercise ourselves unto godliness. Now, it needs to be the right kind of godliness, or the right kind of exercise. Again, it goes on to says in verse 8, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. Now, right there, it may have an allusion to the kind of asceticism that was beginning to be practiced in certain places, and the way people would abuse their bodies, as spoken of in Colossians 2, verses 20 through 23. That profane religion which began to infiltrate the church and saw its manifestation in the forms of monasticism and hermeticism and uh, the various ways in which people would abuse their body and it began to be imposed upon the church larger which is no longer the church as you still see in that certain body today no meat on Friday certain people cannot marry that all came from this abuse that was not the right kind of exercise again godliness is the kind of exercise we exercise ourselves to godliness, and really godliness is the kind of exercise that we practice, living the Christian life. And the Word of God. The Word of God is designed to build up the Christian. As the Apostle Paul warned the elders at Ephesus about certain departures that were to come their way, about an apostasy that was able to infiltrate the eldership among them, he said, and now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give your inheritance among all of them which are sanctified. Built up. Strengthened. The word of God is going to be able to do that. The word of God is able to thoroughly furnish us unto every good work. We're told in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 17. And so we need to spend time in the word. Reading it, studying it, coming together with one another, talking about such matters. Uh, again, we talk about some of the times we've had in fellowship, but we've been talking about some biblical matters. We're told in Scripture that iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the counts of his friend. And so as we talk about some difficult bu- biblical matters, we can sharpen each other and build ourselves up. And as we exercise ourselves in the Word of God, we strengthen ourselves for the trials and temptations of life. In Hebrews 5, verses 12 and following, it is a lament of the church where the Hebrews were living. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have neither one teacher again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat, belong, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Notice that again there. That exercise. Because we've been using the Word of God. We've been studying it. We've been applying it to our lives. And so we can better discern good from evil. Right from wrong. We can know to choose the good and shun the evil. <clears throat> and so we spend time in the Word of God. And also, back to what we noted in James 1, <clears throat> when James said, My brother, can all joy will fall into manifold trials, diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. When your faith is tried, when you go through those temptations, it's going to build up endurance. But let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing, lacking nothing. And so the trials of the Christian life help us to build endurance. We think about various ones who have had to go through struggles. And later on in James, we'll get to that in a moment, but it's going to speak about Job and the various things that he had to suffer. And... uh, None of us desires the type of exercise that Job had in building endurance. He, he had to go through a lot, a terrible hardships. But don't you think 
that after he went through all of that, when temptations came against him later, don't you think that he made any other trials or temptations that came his way with far greater resolve? No doubt he was able to do so because he'd been through trials previously. Again, in Hebrews 12 and verse 1, we read, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, they're speaking about all the individuals spoken of in Hebrews chapter 11, those heroes of faith. We see them that they did live by faith and that they did persevere. They endured. Well, seeing we're compassed about with that cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. That was something that's said to be done when we lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Oftentimes in training, athletes will create challenges for themselves to make things intentionally more difficult during the training so when they're actually running the race or whatever, it will seem more easy. And so they may be running you know, practice, practice running the 100-yard dash. If they still run the 100-yard dash, I have no idea. But they'll do it with ankle weights or things like that to make it harder, to make it more difficult. Or they'll wear a weighted vest. All types of things that they'll do to make these things harder. And so when they actually are in the event, it will seem easier. But the thing is, we do not have the opportunity to begin training before we run, run the race. Once we make the decision, we're in it. We are in the race. The Christian race has begun. And we do not want to make the race more difficult than it has to be. We don't want to try to put on ourselves more than we can bear. But when serious trials do arise, we do need to be strong enough to endure. And that exercise of making it through trials will help us to accomplish just that. And another prerequisite to building endurance is help. An athlete is going to look for any possible permissible advantage that he can find. Whether it's during training or whether it's during the athletic event, if they think it's going to help him in his success in the competition, there's an advantage that he can use, he's going to take that advantage. And so, for example, if there's a runner who's preparing for a race and a very renowned and knowledgeable and experienced trainer says, I I'm going to help you train for that event, assuming he doesn't have someone already fulfilling that role, that athlete would be a fool to turn that trainer away. Same way if an athlete knew of clothes or shoes which he could use that would reduce the stress of running, he would certainly use them in the race. Those would be various kinds of helps that one could use. And we need to keep in mind that for all these things we're saying about building endurance and, and building strength and, and all these things, spiritually speaking, don't forget the Christian cannot rely on his own endurance to complete the Christian race. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear. And so right in the context of saying, be careful, that you think you stand, well, it says actually God is going to provide and make sure that you're going to be okay. But that's the help that he is going to provide and that we're going to need. And thankfully, the Christian has a gracious and powerful father in heaven. We read in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. God had an eternal great plan that came to fruition in the person of his son. The word made flesh, manifest in the church, the kingdom that he established on that great day of Pentecost. And we as Christians are part of that. 
And so God's providence has worked together for centuries that we are allowed to be part of that church, that we have that hope of heaven. And God's providence will continue to work in our behalf. We read in Psalm 46, verses 10 and 11, Be still and know that I am God. And so be still for just a moment and think about what that means. I am God. Just that I am again. He's eternal. And He is God. He, he is powerful. He is God. He is holy. He is God. He is gracious. He is merciful. He is God. He cares for His people. So be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted into the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And so know that. In Isaiah chapter 40, as the prophet has been warning the people about trusting in various physical sources of strength and trusting in other nations and things of that nature, that chapter comes to its conclusion in Isaiah 40, 31 by saying, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Uh, again, that wait upon the Most High, the Most High God. Again, we find ourselves lacking. We think we're wise, we think we're strong, we think we know better than anybody else. Sometimes we might think we even know better than God. Now that is the height of foolishness. But we need to remember, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God to give to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. James 1, verses 5 and 6. And so, look to God. Ask God. Talk to the Father. The Christian has that Father in heaven, and Christ said to pray, Our Father which is in heaven. Don't forget that. Don't forget that help that is there in Him. The Christian also has the Son of God as his mediator, as his advocate, and as his high priest. Again, we think about what all is meant by the fact that the Word, the eternal Word, who is himself God, became flesh. That means so much. Of course, it enabled him to die upon the cross, but it's really more than that. We read in Hebrews 2, verses 17 and 18, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor or to help them that are tempted. Folks, temptation is coming our way and said that there is help that we're going to find in him. Again, we're told in Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16, it goes on and says, For if not in high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, again, he was touched with the feeling of his own infirmities. He took upon flesh so he could do that, but with him, yet without sin. Because of this, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace. Why? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That time of need is going to come. And don't forget that that help is available through our mediator and our advocate and our high priest. In 1 John 2, John begins that chapter by saying, My little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. We read a lot of scriptures that are there to help keep us from sinning. We preach sermons to warn against sin, against the dangers of sin. Don't sin. I warn people, sin not. But John didn't end there. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation, the appeasement for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And so that Son of God, who always did those things that please the Father, He's there to plead in our 
behalf. He is our advocate. And the Christian has the Holy Spirit to help as well. There are three persons in the Godhead and all offer assistance. We read in Ephesians 6 and verse 17 that we can take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so the Holy Spirit has given to each one here a sword that we can wield in the battle. He, he's provided for that, provided that for us. Now the Holy Spirit doesn't wield that for us. You look in the context, we're told that we need to take unto us the whole arm of God. We take the sword of the Spirit. We need to wield it, but He has provided that for us. And, and so we use it. That word of God, which is living and powerful, a powerful weapon, Hebrews 4 and verse 12. It's able to build you up and to give you inheritance among all of them which are sanctified. It's indeed capable to thoroughly furnish unto us unto all good works, that word which the Holy Spirit has given to us. And with regard to our prayers, we're, we're told in that Romans 8 verse 26 that we sometimes don't know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself helpeth our infirmities. We might have these groanings that we cannot utter, but we're told that the Holy Spirit makes intercession in our behalf in heaven where he dwells. And so we have three members of the Godhead all interested in our behalf, and he will intercede. We also find help as we look to examples of endurance. As James says, he had begun his book by saying you count it joy when you're going to fall into these diverse temptations, but you can build up your patience, you can build up your endurance. Well, at the critical conclusion of the book, he says, take my brethren, the prophets, who spoke in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy or blessed who endure. And it goes on to speak about the patience of Job. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. That is, he is full of pity, he is full of tender mercy, and at the end, Job was blessed. Whatever struggles we've gone through, if we remain faithful, if we remain righteous, we will be blessed at the end as well. Again, we're going to need to look to God for our strength. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let the return of the Lord and he'll have mercy upon him, and to our God for he will abundantly part. And that's where it goes on to that well-known statement about his thoughts are not our thoughts. We trust in his thoughts. And we turn away from our ways. We will never successfully win the race if we do not turn to God. Toward the end of Paul's life, he said, The Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 18. And so... God has given us these examples that we can look to. The prophets, the apostles, Job. We read in Genesis 12 and verse 5 about Abraham and his compatriots. They went forth to go in the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And so they had a goal. They had that goal to enter that land, and then they persevered once they had started. Well, consider that example. Now another way in which we can find help is by serving others and serving the church. We've sung these songs about working and laboring, and so we need to be working for achieving the goals, for example, of seeing God glorified. God's people are to glorify Him. When we come together, we glorify Him. We add souls to His church, we glorify Him. We live righteously, we glorify Him, and so we do what we can to see that that goal is achieved. But do whatever you can to serve others and to serve the church. And the thing is, by helping others, by helping the church, you ultimately help yourself because you'll find yourself doing those things that please God. You'll find yourself doing those things that make up the Christian life, and you'll find yourself building up your own endurance to live righteously as you do those things. Again, it's a long and difficult 
race that we have in the Christian race. Again, a marathon, not a sprint. And there have been movies made, there have been songs sung, there have been poems written about the loneliness of the long distance runner. And there are times when it may seem very lonely to live the Christian life. Jesus Christ said it would be that way. But as long as one continues in the race, no Christian is ever left alone. We read in Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For it said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Now there's something you might miss in the English that's there in the original language. In the original language, that never is actually, that's a double negation. And the second is a threefold negation. And so in a way, this could be translated, I will never, never leave thee. I will never, never, never forsake thee, the Lord is telling us. And he goes on and says in verse 6, so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man will do unto me. We have that help available. All of these things help to build endurance. But if one is to overcome anything, he needs endurance. But to be successful in the Christian life requires overcoming the numerous obstacles that Satan is going to be placing on our way throughout that Christian race. It's a marathon, but it's like running hurdles through that marathon. He's going to be doing all things throughout our lives. But through God, we can overcome. You have gone, little children, and have overcome them, we are told. We have overcome the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 1 John 5 and verse 4. We have persevered steadfastly in what Christ has told us. In the world that God has given to us, and we have continued steadfastly to the end. And so let us have goals. Let us have commitment. Let us exercise ourselves unto godliness. And let us seek that help that comes from above and from our faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, that together we may build endurance, and that we might ultimately all arrive at that great goal, heaven itself. Friend, if you're not prepared for that goal, if you've not been fixed on the prize, you could straighten that up today. It's very easy to stumble along the course of the Christian race. It's easy to begin to huff and puff when things get tiring and we feel ourselves getting weary. But there's help to be obtained. We can be lifted up once again from the muck and mire of the sideways and the byways in which sin has entrapped us if we as children of God will simply confess and forsake our sins. We would be glad to pray on your behalf if that's your situation. And if you're here today as one who has yet to begin that Christian race, friend, these are the noblest goals that one could set before himself. But again, setting before oneself the goal of entering into heaven. But it starts as one puts his faith in Christ, repents of sin, confesses that name, and is immersed in water for the remission of sins. If you are ready to do that personally, there's nothing hindering you from that taking place this very evening. And so if you are ready to become a Christian, if you are ready to begin that Christian race, come forward now together we stand and sing the selected song. Amen.